In this video, we construct inverse functions for cotangent, secant, and cosecant. We do this in the same way that we found inverse functions for sine, cosine, and tangent in a previous video. First, let's look at cotangent. Cotangent is the only one of the six trig functions for which the restricted domain is not universally agreed upon. Two different domains are used. On the left, in green, we have one complete branch of the cotangent function. This branch is one to one. It passes through all y values from negative infinity to positive infinity, so it has the same range as the original cotangent function. The branch chosen is one of the two that are equally close to zero, and we're using the one of those that has positive values of x. This branch follows all of the rules. It uses a restricted domain from zero to pi. On the right, in blue, we see a different way to restrict the domain of cotangent. This uses parts of two different branches. The restricted domain must produce a function that passes the horizontal line test. The one place where we have to give that attention is on the x-axis. The x-axis is a horizontal line, so it must pass through the function only once. We can accomplish this by using only one of those two x-intercepts. Where we have a choice between positive and negative, we choose positive. So we include the x-intercept at positive pi over 2 and exclude the one at negative pi over 2. This gives us a function that is 1 to 1 and has the same range as the original. This function uses x values that are near zero and chooses positive rather than negative when a choice must be made, so it follows all the rules. It uses a discontinuous restricted domain from negative pi over two to zero and from zero to positive pi over two. Both versions follow the four rules. The green one on the left places a higher priority on rule four, keeping x values positive. The blue one on the right places a higher priority on rule three, keeping x values close to zero. The green one looks simpler, using only one smooth continuous curve, but the blue one also has an advantage. As you recall, we used a restricted domain for tangent of negative pi over two to positive pi over two. This corresponds to the blue curve, not the green one. Since the cotangent is the reciprocal of tangent, it is convenient to have their restricted domains agree. Depending on which textbook or software package you use, you may see either one of these. My students should use the blue one, because the relationship between cotangent and tangent makes it convenient to have those domains agree. That is the one I will use in this video. To find an inverse for cotangent, we use the discontinuous restricted domain from negative pi over two to zero and from zero to positive pi over two. Note that the range is from negative infinity to positive infinity. Even though the function is in two parts, we do not write the range in two parts. The function passes once and only once through every value of y from negative infinity to positive infinity, so that's how we write the range. The square bracket on the right end of the domain indicates that we include the point where x equals pi over two. This is shown with a solid circle. The y value there is zero. This gives a point on the inverse at zero pi over two. The round parenthesis on the left end of the domain means we do not include the point where x equals negative pi over two. The curve comes up to this point, but does not include the point itself. This is shown with an open circle. The y value there is also zero. This gives a similar point on the inverse an open circle at zero, negative pi over two. Next, we consider the y equals x line. Wherever the function crosses the y equals x line, it shares that point with its inverse. This happens in two places on our graph. Finally, we note that the y-axis is an asymptote of cotangent. This means that the x-axis is an asymptote of the inverse. Where x is positive and close to zero, the y value of the cotangent approaches positive infinity. This means that where y is positive and close to zero, the x value of the inverse must approach positive infinity. In the same way, where x is negative and close to zero, the y value of the cotangent approaches negative infinity, so where y is negative and close to zero, the x value of the inverse must approach negative infinity. We use this information to sketch the inverse function. Notice that it is a reflection across the y equals x line of the cotangent function. This inverse function has a domain of negative infinity to positive infinity, and a discontinuous range of negative pi over two to zero and zero to positive pi over two. As usual, the restricted domain of the original function is the range of the inverse, and the range of the original function is the domain of the inverse. The inverse function can be written cotangent inverse x, or arc cotangent x. Next, we look at secant. It is common for students to use one branch of the secant function as the restricted domain, but that does not work. This branch does not pass the horizontal line test. It is not one to one. Instead, we use only half the branch. To follow rules three and four, we use the branch that includes x equals zero and choose the side where x is positive. This alone is not enough because we need the range to be the same as the original function. The function has branches that go down as well as branches that go up. We need one of the downward ones. We take the one that is closest to x equals zero on the positive side, and now we have a restricted domain that follows all four rules. It is from zero to pi over two 
and from pi over 2 to pi. Recall that the secant is the reciprocal of the cosine. For cosine, we use the restricted domain 0 to pi, which agrees with the domain for secant that we have here. To find an inverse for secant, we use the discontinuous restricted domain 0 to pi over 2 and pi over 2 to pi. Note that the range is also discontinuous because the function does not contain any points with y values between negative 1 and 1. This gives us the range negative infinity to negative 1 and negative 1 to infinity. The function contains the points 0, 1, and pi negative 1 and has a vertical asymptote at x equals pi over 2. This means the inverse must contain the points negative 1 pi and 1 0 and must have a horizontal asymptote at y equals pi over 2. For x values slightly to the right of x equals pi over 2, the function has y values approaching negative infinity. This means that for y values slightly above y equals pi over 2, the inverse must have x values approaching negative infinity. For x values slightly to the left of x equals pi over 2, the function has y values approaching positive infinity. This means that for y values slightly below y equals pi over 2, the inverse must have x values approaching positive infinity. Next, we consider the y equals x line. Wherever a function crosses the y equals x line, it shares that point with its inverse. This function does not touch or cross that line. We can still use the y equals x line as a mirror. The inverse must be a reflection across this line of the original function. We use this information to sketch the inverse function. This inverse function has a discontinuous domain of negative infinity to negative 1 and 1 to positive infinity, and a discontinuous range of 0 to pi over 2 and pi over 2 to pi. As usual, the restricted domain of the original function is the range of the inverse, and the range of the original function is the domain of the inverse. The inverse function can be written secant inverse x or arc secant x. Finally, we look at cosecant. This works very much like secant. We need one piece that goes up and one that goes down. We keep x close to 0, and we get a discontinuous restricted domain of negative pi over 2 to 0 and 0 to pi over 2. This part of cosecant is 1 to 1, it has the same range as the original cosecant function, and it uses values of x that are close to 0. There is no need to choose between positive and negative values of x. To keep the full range, we need both sides. Cosecant is the reciprocal of sine. For sine, we use the restricted domain of negative pi over 2 to pi over 2, which agrees with what we have here for secant. To find an inverse for cosecant, we use a discontinuous restricted domain of negative pi over 2 to 0 and 0 to pi over 2. Note that the range is also discontinuous because the function does not contain any points with y values between negative 1 and 1. This gives us the range negative infinity to negative 1 and 1 to infinity. The function contains the points pi over 2, 1 and negative pi over 2, negative 1 and has a vertical asymptote on the y-axis. This means the inverse must contain the points 1 pi over 2 and negative 1 negative pi over 2 and must have a horizontal asymptote on the x-axis. Next, we consider the y equals x line. Wherever a function crosses the y equals x line, it shares that point with its inverse. This function crosses the y equals x line in two places, giving us two more points on the inverse. The y equals x line also serves as a mirror. The inverse must be a reflection across this line of the original function. For x values slightly to the right of the y-axis, the function has y values approaching infinity. This means that for y values slightly above the x-axis, the inverse must have x values approaching infinity. For x values slightly to the left of the y-axis, the function has y values approaching negative infinity. This means that for y values slightly below the x-axis, the inverse must have x values approaching negative infinity. We use this information to sketch the inverse function. This inverse function has a discontinuous domain of negative infinity to negative 1 and 1 to positive infinity, and a discontinuous range of negative pi over 2 to 0 and 0 to pi over 2. As usual, the restricted domain of the original function is the range of the inverse, and the range of the original function is the domain of the inverse. The inverse function can be written cosecant inverse x or arc cosecant x. Now we have the inverse functions for tangent, secant, and cosecant.